Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope you're all doing well. Um, this, as Tom said, is our final lecture of the I3 series for the spring semester. And I want to welcome up everybody and thank you all for being here. And remind you just once again, if you have a comment or a question, just put it in the chat box and direct it directly to me. And I'll read them at the end and we can have a, a Q&A with Joe. So just hold your questions or write them out onto the chat box and I will read them at the end. Without further ado, I want to uh, introduce to you my friend, the photographer, Joe Quint, a documentary filmmaker and photographer from Brooklyn, New York. He's been widely exhibited, including at Photoville. Um, Joe's work consists largely of telling well-intentioned and re respectful stories about the human condition and people on journeys those who have either experienced great challenges or who have overcome such challenges. Joe has an ongoing project about the impact of gun violence on a diverse group of Americans. And he recently completed an award-winning film about a gun violence and domestic violence survivor who has channeled her traumas into service. So here he is, Joe Quint. Hi, um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks to Ella for asking me to do this and, and, and everyone for, for inviting me along. Um, I, I made some notes, uh, just um, I usually speak off the cuff, but I, I didn't want to ramble. So I, I, I put a couple of thoughts down. Um, I, I guess one of my first thoughts is to sort of why, you know, what, why we're all here and what we all have been had. One of the things that I think we all have in common is I just, I just love photography. It, it, it sort of kind of begins and ends there for me. Um, uh, I, you know, it's, it, it's fun, <laughs> you know, it's just like, it, it, I don't have major platitudes about vision statements and, and all kinds of things. I just, I really enjoy it. I enjoy the, the challenge of it. I enjoy going from nothing to something. Um, I love looking at photos. I love talking to photographers. I, I love just seeing things and seeing photos and saying, damn, I wish I took that shot. You know, um, uh, I love how democratic photography is that that a great photo can can come from anywhere i was teaching a, a class um of middle school kids up up in the bronx photography and we bought them all little 49 dollar cameras from from b and h photo and the pictures that these kids came back with was they were amazing and i was like damn this is like this is great because this is something that's just that's just open open to, to anybody and, and everybody. Um, you know, I, photography, just, it, it's always been there for me when things are good and when, they, and when things aren't so good. Um, it gives me something to do with my hands, you know, because I don't smoke. <laughs> so it, it, it makes me comfortable in, in, in situations. Um, uh, somebody said it, I, forget, I, I don't know who, and maybe Stella, I'm sure, I'm sure you do, that it kind of gives you a, a a license to be someplace where otherwise you'd have no business being paraphrasing. Um, but I kind of like, I just, I, I, I love that thought. Um, but I wasn't always, um, you know, the part about giving me license to, to be in places, I wasn't always like that. I was actually kind of for a long time, deathly, deathly, deathly afraid of photographing people. I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I didn't feel like I had a right to do it. I, I felt, I just, I was just paralyzed with it. Um, then I was talking to a, a friend of mine, also a, a documentary photographer who also does long-term projects. And he was working on a project for seven years. And I've been working on some of my projects for three years, four years, seven years. Um, and, and he was talking about this idea of, um, how people want you to share their stories. It, people who've been through something, as, as Stella mentioned in the introduction, people who were on journeys, who have been through something, they want to share their story with you um, so long as they can trust you, so long as they, as they know that you're going to handle their story with, um, 
with respect and, and with dignity and, and, and with good intention, and that you're going to cradle it very, it's got dark over here for a second, um, that you're going to cradle it gently and, and that you, you're going to treat it with, with the, um, the, the respect and the dignity and, and, and the good um, and the good intention that that all these stories deserve, and that was a very liberating thought for me. That that I wasn't just taking something from somebody. That we we're having this collaborative uh, experience. Um, that that it was a give and take. And then I was just sort of like, yeah, just a switch flipped, and I was kind of off off to the races. So I'm going to share my screen starting now. Right. So. I began, there was an organization that I started working with that um, uh, is a nonprofit that helped formerly homeless men and women gain full-time employment and stable housing. Um, and it was a, it was a re-entry project. It was how, how are these people returning into, into society, um, you know, in only six months, typically only six months after being either incarcerated or in, um, in, in homeless shelters. Uh, and so I started photographing their, why is my, sorry. I started photographing their graduation ceremonies. What would happen when they would, they, they would obtain, finally obtain full-time full employment and they were just, they were positive and it was life-changing and it was, they were emotional and, and people just, what they had accomplished in just such a short amount of time and how they, they came out of this just in a completely different way. Family members would come, friends would come. Um, it was just, they were all moments of joy and celebration and feelings of, uh, of accomplishment, of great accomplishment because they, they did miraculous work to get to where they are. You know, I, I would always say like, if I would go to one of these graduation ceremonies and I photographed a ton of them. And I always remember saying, if people outside of this room could see what was going on inside this room and could see the catharsis that had taken place and, and just the life changing moments that, that were happening, this nonprofit, they'd have to beat donations off with a stick. So part of the reason why I took these photographs was to, share the good work that that's being done. You know, kids would show, who, who, you know, who, you know, whose parents might not have been in the picture or, you know, they would, families would reunite and, and it was just an amazing thing to, to, to be a part of. So then I started photographing these really tight portraits of some of the participants. Um, again, just to not only communicate um, their journey, but that they're in the middle of something. Uh, and, you know, there's a little bit of trepidation because who knows where they're gonna come out on the other side, um, but they wanted everybody, there was a line out the door. Everybody who was in the program wanted to have their face shown, have their voice heard, and, and their story told. I also did it. Um, these these we we blew these up enormous um, for the office of the of, of where all these the, the the staff worked to remind them of why they were there in the first place. You know, um, nobody who goes into this line of work in, in in working for a nonprofit obviously is doing it is doing it for the money. Right, they're doing it because it makes them feel good to create change. So this just sort of reminded them, oh yeah, this is why we're here. This is the this is our mission. Our mission is to is to serve. You know, it's, it was very motivating for people. You know, they're in all stages of their of their process but they all want to be seen. So, so building off of, the, of that work and being so just inspired by, 
by these people um, and, 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 what, and what they're doing, I started looking for other people who are creating change, either change for themselves or change for, for other people. Uh, I spent some time in DC and got connected. Actually, no, this, sorry, this is in, in New Orleans. I spent some time in New Orleans and got connected with uh, a church in not such a hot neighborhood where the, um, the, the, uh, the minister would do outreach into the community and go out into the neighborhood and bring kids into the church um, for a safe space, for uh, homework help, for a, for a good meal, um, not, to, not to preach and not to, to um, uh, what's the word, uh, um, recruit, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, per, you know, a congregation, but just because he felt a duty to serve. That was his mission, was to help the people in this community. Was that, yeah. Um, so just kids of all, all different kinds. And he would just, yeah, he would just walk, walk to the streets every day after school, bringing kids in. You know, healthy food. A lot of times these kids are not getting good meals at home. So they, they need a place to go. You know, and again, dedicated staff. There's people who are there because they want to be there. You know, um, and I felt very welcome here. Uh, they opened their open their doors to me, open the, you know, every, everyone opened their heart to me. Um, I think because they sensed that I was there for, for a good reason. You know, sometimes there were issues with the kids, um, you know, because they're coming from all different home life situations, but the staff was there to be very, um, very caring and very supportive. You know, it was not a, wonderful neighborhood. So every day these kids needed to pass by this gigantic wall that unfortunately was called the murder wall that honored all the people, a lot of the people in that parish, in that particular area who had been, who had been killed. Um, and it, it, it underscored um, the need for the service that, that this church performed. You know, similarly, a community center in, in D.C., very similar work and with, you know, a safe space and, and, and heroes working there, you know, real heroes just working there and creating this um, wonderful, supportive environment. And this is my sweet spot. This is just like, let me get in here. Let me connect with people on, um, on an emotional level um, and, and take myself out of it, you know, and just, and just be there for no other reason to, that, but to, um, to lift their stories up. I mean, and that, you know, I spent, gosh, I don't even know how, how, how long I spent here, but it was, um, you know, it's funny, people, they, they use this, this idea of like, oh, I just want to be a, a, a fly on the wall in these situations. And I never really related to that because, you know, first of all, I don't think there's any such thing as being like, oh, I'm, I'm invisible. I'm, you know, act like I'm not here. I, I want people to know that I'm here and I want them to feel so comfortable with me there that, that that's how they then go about what, what, what they're doing versus try to, okay, pretend I'm not here and act natural. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way for me. You know, people with like, sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because there's one thing that, that I, that I want to see, you know, 
people with boots on the ground, like this woman on, on, on the left, you know, um, these are people who inspire me. These are people who just, I, and you'll see when we get to some other work, you know, there, there's just some people who I'm just, I'm just so in love with their spirit and their, their ability to, to do what they do. You know, they're just about joy, just about joy and positivity. And, and as Stella mentioned in, in the beginning, um, the, the, the human condition and this just sort of shared sense of, of humanity that, that, that we all have. Like that's, I think, one thing that I'm always looking for is to, is to find um, where we're more, more, the, more the same than, than we are different. So that brings me to a strange place, <laughs> which is um, right shortly after that last body of work was created, um, some incidents in the country happened where I, I, I had always uh, felt strongly about the issue of gun violence prevention, and I never did anything about it. Um, and it always bothered me that I, that I never did anything about it, but you know, life gets in the way and, and, and we don't all do the, the things that, that we feel like, like, like we're supposed to do. You know, um, uh, every day something bad happens somewhere in the world and every day I do nothing about it, right? But I, I finally had my, had my tipping point moment. Um, it was after, a, unfortunately, a, a mass shooting incident not too dissimilar from what we tragically had had today here here in Brooklyn. Um, and the cover story of that week's People magazine was this celebrity wedding, um, which who cares, right? And but in the top right corner it said college murderers, how could this happen again? Um, and setting aside just the the obvious discrepancy in, in the, the importance of these two stories, what I was really struck by was the sort of smacking of the head of, well, what do you mean, how could it happen again? Like, how, how, could it, how could it not happen again? Where at the time, and this was a number of years ago, uh, at the time, we hadn't really done anything collectively as a country to prevent it from happening again. So why on earth should we be should, should we be, we'd be surprised. So I said, all right, well, this, this is my moment. This is my moment where I need to stop talking about this. I need to stop signing petitions or liking posts on Facebook and convincing myself that, that I was engaged. I needed to do what I do, which is pick up a camera and, and get to work. So I started reaching out to my community to see if I knew anybody who'd been, who'd been impacted by gun violence. And sure enough, um, more than a few hands went up. Um, so I started photographing them and telling them stories, telling their stories. Um, and then it just kind of sort of unfortunately snow, you know, grew, grew from there. Um, a little caveat before, before I show the work that, that I always present is um, the photos are not graphic at all, because I don't believe in that. Um, I feel it's, it's exploitative. It's, it's, gratuitous, it gives people an excuse to, to look away. Um, so I, I don't believe in that, but I will say that the stories are a little intense. So if, um, if this, if seeing work like this and dealing with, with, with the subject is um, trauma inducing for, for somebody, take care of yourself first. And, and I, I don't, I won't be offended if you disappear for 10, 15 minutes and then, and then come back. Um, again, it's not, it's not graphic, but it's, it's emotional and people need to, 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 to look out for themselves. Um, so I started photographing people. I started photographing people uh, all over the country, everywhere from Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, all, all the, the names that we know as being you know, where, where we all think gun violence is, 
to um, the suburbs, to an indigenous people reservation in rural Oklahoma, because this is a problem that it's an epidemic and, it, and it's something that just cuts through all of society. Um, as we saw today, unfortunately. And I, I was saying before everybody popped into the popped into the room that the number of times over the years where I've had to present this work on a day where there was a tragic incident is staggering. It's just it just it's happened a bunch of times. There's been there's been uh, days where mass shootings have happened on the anniversary of other mass shootings. I mean, it's crazy, uh, but yet that that happens. And then there's the untold number of stories that we don't hear about, right? Because we just hear what what the the, the media thinks is the is the sexiest, unfortunately. Uh, but there's countless countless stories that that we never hear. Stories of people who died by suicide, stories of people who were um, uh, killed in a, in a domestic violence incident. Um, so it just, it just cuts through everything. And, and these are stories that, that need to be told. You know, um, and again, this is all about trust. I could, there's no way that I could make this work and that I could get so intimately involved with people if they, if they didn't want me there. There's just no way. Uh, especially this community of violent survivors or, or family members, they've been so uh, re-victimized by the courts and by the media and by everything that they're very, they're very guarded with, with, with their story, um, especially people who've had very high profile incidents because then they get harassed online and all, all kinds of horrible things. Um, so it was a little difficult to to break in to this to, to this community um, because I was an outsider and and because they they didn't know that that they could trust me. It took a little bit of time um, for people to see the work and go, okay, I get it now. I, I get what this guy's about. He's not gonna he's not gonna do this kind of hatchet job on us the way um, the way that it's been done before. It's a very tight knit community, the gun violence survivor community. So once people started seeing other people that they 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 know, that sort of op opened the doors. Um, you know, this this gentleman in in Philadelphia unfortunately had been shot many many times. You know, because uh, he just rolled in a certain environment, and so he didn't really he didn't really go outside much anymore. Um, uh, you know, and it's, I always say like, like, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are and what you're doing and whether you're, you know, an altar boy or not, you know, no, nobody deserves to get shot. You know, it's, uh, um, no, no, nobody deserves what, what these people experience. You know, this guy was, uh, Antonius, his name is, and he was, you know, so many times people are just in the right place. The everyone says, oh, this is in the wrong place at the wrong time. This gentleman and a number of other people I photographed, they were all in the right place at the right time doing exactly what they have every right to be doing. Uh, he, was, he was going to a, a barbecue on the 4th of July and, and he got in between a guy who was in a dispute with his girlfriend or, or, or his partner and just got hit in the crossfire and, and his life changed. Um, completely random, doing, you know, the exact thing that he's supposed to be doing on July 4th, going to a barbecue. But because we live in this country, these things happen all, all, all too frequently. Um, what a lot of people don't know um, is that uh, suicide by gun is the leading cause of gun deaths in this country. And um, part of it has to do with unfettered access, the unfettered access that people who are at risk of hurting themselves or, or um, hurting someone else, they can get a gun easily. And um, it just, you know, uh, if, if somebody, 
uh, has the intention of, of ending their life. Unfortunately, a gun just makes it um, tragically easy. Uh, this gentleman's son, he was in Louisville, Kentucky. The, the boy called 911 prior to, to ending his life so that the family would know sort of where to, where to come find him, which was just tragically awful. Um, you know, New Year's Eve, July 4th, people engage in this ridiculously stupid practice of celebratory gunfire. They fire guns up in the air, you know, and what's Happy New Year. Um, and they come down, the bullets come down. And one came down in this young man's head when he, when he was a kid, paralyzed, to multiple surgeries, uh, double vision, you know. Um, but, you know, every once in a while, there's a story with sort of a, a, a happy ending. Like this guy, Joe, got to, you know, I'm, I'm sure he would have not, not have wanted it this way, but he got to spend time with his father that he never would have got to spend otherwise. You know, uh, he would have been in school. He would have been, been living his own life. So, you know, it, it um, they, they get to do something where, where they wouldn't otherwise get to do. Um, the father was, was a, a retired cop. He was around all day. His mother, you know, his, his wife worked nights. So he, they would never see each other. Um, and, you know, again, uh, happy ending. He got married not long ago, Joe, which is uh, always nice to hear. Um, their uncle was, was no, their, their, their brother and their uncle were, were shot and killed. Um, just one of the many tragic acts of everyday gun violence that we just don't hear about. Um, you know, Jane was just a, you know, years of domestic abuse and gun violence abuse. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that this project has done is, you know, you, you could be walking down the street, you'd be standing on line next to somebody in the supermarket and you, just, and you never know what's behind their story and, and having them let me into their life, um, and give me this this gift of, of being in their life. Um, just, it just was so eye-opening of what, of what some people are just, are, are walking around with, you know? And so we'll sit and we'll talk and we'll, you know, we'll go to the dark place, you know? And, and I, I'll be in the situation of, you know, if you were at a, some kind of social function with somebody and they told you that they had been shot you'd say oh well it's terrible and let's try to change the subject because it's because it's really disturbing i'm in the position of saying well let's let's talk about it and let's go there and let's go deeper in there um take me to the to the worst moment of your life so but it needs to be a, a collaboration a, a journey that we're taking together we um we take each other apart and we put each other back together again i can't just go in there and take and say okay thanks very much i got i got what i'm here for goodbye right we take each other apart and, and we put each other back back together again um another case guys in the right place at the right time he's at a party he's trying to pick up a girl the girl just broke up with her boyfriend the boyfriend comes back all pissed off um this is in philadelphia also and the philadelphia because gun violence is such a big problem they have this program called Scoop and Run, where rather than, you know, if the cops are coming by, rather than wait for the ambulance, they'll pick somebody up, they'll throw them into the back of the car, and they'll race them up Broad Street in Philly to Temple University Hospital. Um, when these guys went, got to the hospital, pointed to the ambulance and said, see that ambulance? That's the one that's going to get you, <laughs> you know? And the trauma surgeon said that if that had, if he had waited that long, he certainly would have died. And he got the, you can see on, on his left shoulder he had the names of the uh of the two officers that saved his life tattooed on his chest suicide by gun her her military husband shot himself and as as a i don't know as a last act of i don't know what sort of did it in front of her so she, that she would suffer for the rest of her life um everyday gun violence 
right? Her her 14 year old son was walking home from a party here in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, Friday night, a lot of people on the street, no one said anything because nobody wants to, to get involved and, and, and stick their neck out. Um, her financial situation was such that she had to bury her son uh, in New Jersey um, and would not get to see him that often. So we went there, you know. Um, I wanted to, very important for me to share people's story where they wanted it shared. Because uh, this is not, again, it's not about me. This is about where do you want your story told? What's a significant place for you? Um, we're in the Las Vegas desert, right? And it's federal, it's federal land, just wide open federal land. And guys would just go there and with their guns and blow shit up. Like that was just something you would do on a Saturday afternoon. And, um, and you know, being from New York, I never saw anything like it. So I just kind of came up and, hi, I'm a stranger in your land. What the hell's going on here? And, and we were talking about it, but I was with um, this woman, Stephanie, who had gone there with, um, actually her husband had taken her uh, then eight-year-old twins forget if they were six or eight year old twins, had taken her up into the hill to do, to shoot, but to shoot in a safe place, far away from everybody else. Um, because, you know, they're responsible gun owners. They're not lunatics, you know, just acting unsafely and, 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 and with that regard for other people. And unfortunately, a even though they were really far away from everybody else, a bullet came into their car and, and struck and killed the, her daughter um, and her identical, you know, her not identical, but her twin brother was sitting right next to him. So these are, these are just lives that are, that are forever changed. You know, people don't really talk about the long-term impact of gun violence. And that's what, um, that's what so much of this project is about. Um, again, gun suicide, you know, um, Diane's daughter, the, the meta, you know, she struggled with, with mental health issues her whole life and the, um, the medication actually that, that her daughter took to balance her out was harder to get, harder to obtain than the gun that she was able to get to, to end her life. Um, uh, Eddie had had a horribly traumatic childhood experience with gun violence, seeing his mother murdered, um, and uh, was really on a long road coming back, um, dealing with his trauma, dealing with his PTSD, dealing with what had been implanted in his head, you know, at, su at, at such an early age. Um, and so we go out to this park in, in, in DC, and he's, t he's telling me that, um, He's in the best place of his life, and uh, but he never knows where uh, when depression is gonna gonna rear its ugly head again. But he has a whole support system in place, and tragically, a month later, he ended his life with a gun. You know, right place, right time, at a party. You know, now 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 Dre is a. Um, a quadriplegic, a, a nonverbal quadriplegic. Um, and his mother is the strong, bar none, the strongest person I've ever met, or one of one of the two strongest people I've ever met. Um, and and the what she's done to advocate for her son and 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 he's, he's fighting his way back, you know, and, and he's become a little verbal and 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 there's a light on. Um, but it's just, you know, right place, right time tragedy, you know, unsecured guns getting in the hands of, of kids. Young boy's brother was, was unintentionally shot by, by a friend. Suburbs, you know, Cranston, Rhode Island, or, 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 or a town outside of there. You know, I always say that I could have done, I could have done this whole project in my backyard. You know, uh, but then it would have been largely about one thing. It would not have been about the wide range of, of people.
and the wide range of, of types of incidents. You know, he wanted to be, his mother ended his life, ended her life. And, and I asked him where he wanted to be photographed. And he said, by the, you know, by, by, by Lake Michigan, because that is the vastness related to, to the emptiness that, that he felt, you know, this isn't about me. This is about where, where they want their stories told. Um, I asked this young boy where or what, how does he deal with the fact that his um, stepbrother shot and killed his brother? And, you know, five minutes before he's being a nine-year-old kid, he's running around, he's playing, he's, do, he's do, doing whatever. Uh, and he looks at me dead in the eye and says, I have a very, 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 very strong family. I was just like, whoa, where this, you know, like, like this kid just switched and just completely changed. And, and I just got the, I just got the chills. Um, uh, this is Lucy McBath, who's a, a U.S. Congresswoman. Um, her son Jordan was murdered in a pretty high profile case in Florida. Um, and she became, as so many do, this, this accidental activist fighting for, um, for common sense gun reform. Um, never, she was a flight attendant for 30 years, never held elected office, never had any vision of, um, of holding elected office, but as, as part of her newfound mission, um, she ran for Congress in Georgia uh, in Newt Gingrich, to anyone who knows who Newt Gingrich is, in Newt Gingrich's old district. So a African-American woman in a red state in that district, never served in office, running on a gun violence prevention platform is now a sitting member of US Congress which is pretty amazing. Um, my, one of the first people I photographed, good friend Luis, shot and paralyzed when, when he was 14. And just like Joe, um, a number of slides ago, you know, it's nice when these stories have, have a happy ending. Um, through the magic of, of modern science, he was able to have a, a young boy named Prince, named the Prince because he wanted him to grow up to be a king, which I always loved. And Prince actually, I just saw today on Instagram, had his... Easter photos taken, and maybe he's like five or six years old now, and just, you know, it's nice when these stories end well. Um, so again, this could be difficult to watch, but I think it's an important story to watch. Um, it, this is a short film that I made about a number of the um, educators who were present at the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. It runs about four minutes long. So let me see if this plays. I remember one of the kids asking what the sound was and one of the other kids said it sounds like a dog barking and I thought yeah well it could be a dog barking because I'm not going to say what it really is so I said well that's probably why we have to go into lockdown because maybe a dog got into the building well and I was thinking even though I heard gunshots like it never translated to gunshots. many many people are going to die right. like never in my you because because right. you just you're in Sandy Hook Elementary School and library class just began I remember shaking because I had yes. to get the cover on the window of the door yes. and being scared to get to the door because that's where the sound was coming from. And like, but I knew I had to do it, but I couldn't do it. And I, it was just like that whole struggle of going back. Oh my God. Oh. Right. You went into autopilot. Yes. Yes. You know, and that's what I felt like. I was doing what I had to do just out of routine. You know, right? And counting them, I just oh kept counting gosh. them over. And that's all I kept saying is, I have one absent. When we were in the lockdown, I, you know, you're just doing. You're trying to distract them, reading books, whatever I, everybody else did, um, and then and then that rescue, and then and then you're in the firehouse, and and the the chaos and the noise and the was so hot and we were so thirsty. And your parents. And that 
and and the brain protecting you would not let me figure out what was happening it was just murmurs of things and I actually do remember covering my ears like I just did not want to know and then we tried to make it a game for the kids and said you know we're gonna we're gonna go in the closet but they knew that wasn't part of the drill and they said why are we moving and we said because we need to find the best hiding place in the school and one of the kids said do we get a prize I said yes (laughs) yes you get a prize just be quiet and go quickly on the floor and they said is it candy I said, yeah, yep, it's candy, yep, it's a lot of candy, but just remember, it's a quiet game, so we're climbing into the closet. And then having to lie to the kids when I was so terrified to say, oh, those must be the, the good guys, here are the heavy boots. I mean, I was like, what is going on? And then I have to open the door. Somebody said to me, Mrs. Clements, you're shaking. And I have to say, like, I'm a little scared. It was actually, like, two weeks after that I still wasn't sure if I had died that day or if I was still alive. I remember just not being sure. Feeling like I was just watching everyone around me. Yeah. They were carrying on. Weird out-of-body experience, right? Like, I could have just died, and and I'm watching them. I'm watching them carry on. It was... I know exactly. Yep. It was like you almost had no feeling. I mean, totally numb. We're listening to this, right? Watching it. Right. And you're just like going through the motions of your day thinking, I should be falling apart. I should be crying. I should be like completely devastated. But you're like, like nothing. And it's also like watching people near you, but not being able to engage and not be able to Mm -hmm. be present. Mm -hmm. You're just watching it all happen. That went on for a long time. Months. Yeah. Yes. How'd you go home and deal with your own family? I wasn't there. No. Like I was there, but I wasn't there. Well, and other people were there, so probably yeah, there for them. Yeah, my family was there. And... Yeah. We're lucky to be alive. We know the horror of what happened there. But I'll never be the same. No. Torn, <clears throat> torn apart, torn shreds, your family changes. We'll never be the same. Will I do good things because of it and fight for things from it? Yeah. I don't, I don't know, but I feel like, the, like I'm still doing that. Where there are parts of me, I wake up every day and say, did this really happen? And I can contextualize it now after two years and understand that, that this is just part of me, but the, 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 the tearing apart of a person who goes through this and when you and and the grief that we feel for the horror that happened the day and the families and and, and every then time t- after I know. every time there's a new one I know. so this is who we are now this is who we are yeah So I've all but stopped, or I I had all but stopped that project um, in in part because I felt like I had nothing. I got to the point where I just, not so much after this film, but years later, where I didn't didn't have anything new to contribute to the conversation. Uh, And I, and I, as while all these stories are unique and and tragic, uh, I didn't want to be redundant. I didn't want to, to keep going if I had nothing new to say. Plus, I needed a break just for my own self-care from sitting and photographing over 100 stories. For my own sanity and for my own self-care, I needed to, to step away for a while. Um, so when I talked in the beginning about like photography is always there when times are good and when times are not so good, <laughs> times are not so good. So I, I needed to step away and I, and I was looking for a project that was more about joy. Um, I remember years ago, a friend had called me up. They were getting married um, at the marriage bureau, uh, city clerk's office down in lower Manhattan. And they didn't know that they needed a witness. So I ran down there with a witness to their wedding. And I was just sort of blown away by the diversity there and the happiness there. It was the only 
city building I ever been in that where you didn't need a metal detector to 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 go through because everybody was there ostensibly you know um, for for good reason uh, and so I just started hanging out outside and asking people if I could photograph their wedding you know and just give them you know and they had their New York faces on they were like hey what's going on well you know some people were just skeptical but I said no I'm working on this project and I would just love to photograph your your wedding as 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 a gift to you. Um, and man, the, just the, the diversity down here, I think, um, you know, uh, short of like the subway and jury duty, it's probably just the most diverse place that I've been. And, but yet everyone's there for the same reason. This is a French couple who just thought, Hey, it'd be, you know, they're here on vacation. It'd be, hey, it'd be cool to get married in New York, you know, um, but it does have a little bit of a department of motor vehicles feel to it at the same time. And it's everybody, right? And it's just really nice after spending so much time on gun violence stuff to be surrounded by happiness. <laughs> I needed this for my, for my soul. Still keep in touch with a lot of these people. I've sent them photos. They, they reach out to me on their anniversaries. It's really sweet. Not everyone there wants to get married. <laughs> we'll say <laughs> this gentleman did not want to be there. Uh, I think um, his then his now wife was a little bit of a, of a powerhouse. But yeah, he was, he kind of wished he was somewhere else. You know, just people right just up against each other. It's all different walks of life. Um, Right after she got married, she said, um, her first words after getting married was, holy shit, my father's going to, I can't believe I'm married, my father's going to kill me. So I was like, all right, well, that's an interesting, <laughs> you know, not, I'm so happy, but hopefully things worked out well for her. I got, a, you know, um, somebody caught wind of this work, and I got an assignment to, to, Photograph the first day of um, same-sex weddings um, in in New York. Um, I guess right after the Supreme Court, after the Supreme Court decision, I guess they started it like a couple months later, and they they opened it. It was on a Sunday, uh, and they opened the clerk's office uh, on a Sunday, and they brought in all the judges, and it was just this incredibly incredibly happy day. You know, it was mobbed, and I got you know the the staff was crying the. Clerks were crying, the judges were crying, and just everybody was just so delighted to, 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 to be there. That was a pretty special day. You know, and just to be able to share this, such an important moment in, in people's life was, was amazing. Every once in a while when I'm feeling like stressed out, you know, uh, or um, burnt out by the kind of work that I'm doing, I'll go back there and I'll, 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 I'll spend the day. It's just, it's just kind of fueling. So then I started thinking about my work with gun violence again but wanted to come at it from a different place. Again, lo looking, for, looking for heroes. Um, and I was introduced to this woman in, uh, in North Philadelphia uh, who was a years long gun violence survivor and domestic violence survivor who channeled her trauma into, into service. Um, she lives and works in a neighborhood in, in, in Philly. Um, that has one of the worst opioid epidemics of, of anywhere in the country. Um, she's personally, at this point, the number keeps changing, but at this point, she's personally used 
um, Narcan, which is a drug that they use to reverse overdoses, to save over 900 lives. Um, she's taught hundreds of people how to do this. So through her, thousands and thousands and thousands her, her, of lives um, have been saved. Um, her brother tragically was was murdered and they never found the killer. So they so she works with families who have unsolved murder cases um, to help them either get some justice or just get get support. Um, so I realized that her story was more, again, all these stories, the people I photographed are, are unique and tragic in their own way. Her story, because of her life experience, uh, and I just sort of scratched the surface of, of all the things, I mean, talk about having nine lives. I mean, I've just really scratched the surface of all the things that, that this woman's experienced. Um, it was so layered that it really called out for, to, to, to become a film. Um, I never made a, a, a short film or a feature length film before, but I just said like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start, rather than wait until I know what I'm doing, I'm just gonna start. Because sometimes there's just no substitute for just starting, you know, and I, mean, I have hours and hours and hours and hours of footage that's complete garbage, you know, but it, it was a process that I needed to go to to get to, 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 to where I am. It just, there's just no substitute for, for uh, that kind of investment of, of time, both in learning what you're doing and getting connected to your story. And again, this is another community that's been horribly, horribly maligned. I mean, um, photographers and journalists and news, they, all, uh, they come in and pardon the expression, they just, um, they look for the, for the poverty porn and the trauma porn and the addiction porn and just the, the worst low hanging fruit. And they just beat the hell out of this neighborhood um, and uh, show the, the people who are in addiction or people facing housing insecurity in just the, 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 the worst way. So I, this is the trailer of the film. Uh, the, full, the full film is about 15 minutes long and is now making the rounds through film festivals, both here and, and the UK. Uh, doing quite well, which, I'm, which, which we're grateful about. I'm actually going up to Boston next week for a festival and had a screening last week. So it's getting, it's getting some, some nice attention and getting, and more importantly, because I don't need, you know, the, the dopamine hit of, of getting into festivals. More importantly, it's, it's getting this story out into the world and um, hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of those sort of people I was talking about who, who, who do the work that I don't really love about, you know, the sort of, uh, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. Uh, they'll, they'll sometimes hide behind this idea of, well, it's, we're just showing all this horrible stuff because we're, we're raising awareness, which I just think is, is a lot of crap because I think we all know what poverty looks like. We all know what addiction looks like. We all know what consuming drugs looks like. That's just, it's just, just being, Gratuitous. I, so I, I like to think of it as my role with this film is not to raise awareness in as much as it is to raise compassion. So with that, this is the trailer. Oh. Is he breathing? Is he breathing? I find myself helping the most broken people because I was broken. And nobody came to fix me. The people that I serve on the street, I call them my sunshines. They're called junkies and addicts and all these negative things. They all have this thing inside them that just needs some help coming out, this light. Empathy is love, and that's why the same kind of love I want to receive, I want my sunshines to receive too. So this is what I'm hitting the streets with today. A lot, a lot of doses of Narcan. If they're still unresponsive, tilt the head back, administer the Narcan, and rescue breaths.
my work is my identity. You have to have more than that one purpose. And I haven't found that since the murder of my brother or the murder of my boyfriend. I haven't found that within myself. So how must I changed me? Part of me says, if I can't help someone who's been through some trauma, then I'm no use. And do I even know how to live if something bad doesn't happen? You know, again, I, in the beginning, right, she, she's running, she's running toward, towards um, somebody who's, who's overdosed. And I don't, you know, I, as much time as I spent down there, I've never filmed her. I've been present when she's done a ton of reversals, but I've never filmed one because I would never want, I don't want to show somebody the worst moment of their life. I would not want someone seeing me at the worst moment of mine. Um, I think we're all more than the worst moments of our lives. Uh, so I don't, I don't need to do that. Um, I sat on a panel discussion about the film where people were talking about like media and ethics of, of filming in my community. And some people were saying, oh, you should blur the faces and all this kind of stuff. And I, I didn't, I never did that because I'm not, um, I'm not showing anybody in a light that they would not want to be seen. I'm showing them being treated with, with respect and, and with dignity and with love and, um, and, Someone's walking down the street calling them the sunshine. I mean, what, what, what better could you say to somebody who's probably either getting ignored by society or just getting completely overlooked by society to acknowledge them, to recognize them and to, and to shine a light on them, I just think is pretty, is pretty amazing. So with that, thanks again for having me. I'm a little emotionally overwhelmed. I know. I'm your sorry. <laughs> no, 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 but in a really good way. You know, you call yourself a documentary photographer. I think you're a humanist photographer because of, I think it's so important the way you talk about coming from a place of respect and getting to know people and not, not showing them in a traditional way. I think that's a really important thing. I also wonder with the films that you've started to make, are you still doing, um, Still image, or have you moved um, into moving image? I'm still doing. I'm, I'm still doing stills. I I'm a little more excited about film lately. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not turning my back on the other, but when I'm thinking about like, oh, what's my next project going to be? I have more ideas for film projects than I do for stills projects. You know, I um, I like long term projects. You know. Um, so when I think about, okay, what's my next long-term project going to be? I think, I think film. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether it's continuing this one and making it more of a feature length or just starting something else. I got, I got a, a number of things that I'm, that I'm kicking around. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a couple of comments and questions for you. I'd like to read, let me get to it. Ah, Zona says, wants to thank you very much for sharing. I can feel the emotion in some of the photos. Nice work. I have some questions about the images of children. Did you get permission from their parents before you took the pictures? If you asked them to, did you ask them to sign releases? Do you have any suggestions if we need to take photos of children? Um, I, I, I would rarely ask in words, can I take your, your, your photos? I think that sometimes kills a moment. It's more about a, a, a nonverbal um, understanding and, and agreement. They, 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 they know that I'm there, they'll back me off. If they don't want me there, well, I'll smile, I'll nod, I'll, I'll um, communicate what I'm there for without ruining the moment of 
stopping and having a, a, a conversation. And if they don't want it, they don't want it. And fine, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not insulted and I'm not, uh, and it's not like, hey, I have a right to do this. You're in a public place and whatever. Um, you don't want it, that's okay, that's cool. Um, so, so no, I don't necessarily, I don't verbally ask for permission. There have been some cases, um, like with the Married at City Hall project, yeah, when there were, when there were kids involved, I, I would, after the fact, because um, I would always send people, and this is key, right? I would always send people photos afterwards. I'd create a whole gallery and I'd send them high res photos. And I've sent people big prints over the years, um, you know, because they gave me a gift, you know? Um, and then I would sort of say, oh, and by the way, could you, could you sign this? Because I, I, I didn't know if the project would, would become anything bigger. Would it become a book? There was a time so I was thinking like maybe it's a reality show. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to pr protect myself in, in that way. With the gun violence stuff, no. Because again, we just have this, un I just would have this understanding with people that um, I'm not trying to get over on you. I'm just trying to, to elevate your story. Should I technically probably, but I just I just don't, you know. And uh, it maybe it'll come back to bite me in the ass one day. I don't know, but it's just um, it just doesn't with the gun violence work. It just doesn't seem really in the spirit of 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 what I'm doing. That being said, if I get a call from um, some publication that 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 wants to run them. I'm gonna go back to the people who I who I photographed and said, hey, you know, whatever, PBS NewsHour want, wants to use these photos. Are you okay with it? So that they're not all of a sudden watching TV or, or, or looking at the New York Times or wherever they are and see their photo. And if they say no, then no. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, the unspoken uh, deal that we've struck. Okay. Understood. Uh, Gloria Nelson is interested in how you kept yourself safe in the in the fringe neighborhoods and among the populations. I think in reference to the gun violence stories. Um, time, just spending a just spending a lot of time there um, with people, like with Roz in, in the film. She knows everybody in the community, so if I'm if I'm walking around with her, then I'm, I'm automatically you know, accepted. Uh, but again, she'd say, you know what? We shouldn't go to this corner because I know they're not gonna be responsive to seeing you, you walk around with the camera. Okay, that's fine. Um, and, uh, and by going up to people and like those guys, like those guys in, the, in the desert, right? If I, was a mile away with a big lens photographing them, they would have, what the hell is this guy doing? And I would have had a problem, but I went up to them and I said, hey, I'm not from around here, what's going on? And then they couldn't wait to show me and, hey, do you wanna shoot my gun? I'm like, no, no thanks. Um, you know, uh, so it's, you know, it's time, it, it's going around with somebody who's known and, and, and respected in the neighborhood. Um, uh, and, and I think you also, I think when you feel like you're, this is like, I, I should speak for myself. When I feel like I'm doing something that I'm, that I'm, have, they say every right to do makes it sound like, again, I have my rights and blah, blah, blah. It's like, if I'm doing something that that's, I feel is well-intentioned and that, that I feel like, well, nobody would have a problem with this, then I think I carry myself in a way that, that communicates that. You know, there's, there's a video of this neighborhood up on YouTube that has like a million views, but you can tell, totally tell the guy's like filming it from his car. He's, he's a mile away and he's, photographing people who have no idea that, that he's there and he's not engaging with them. And I think that um, you know, that makes all, all the difference in the world. Um, yeah, there's been times I felt unsafe. Um, 
but I just kind of like, you know, just can't do it anyway, <laughs> you know. And uh, you know, I've, I've been with I've been with Roz, and there's been you know gunshots, and we've said let's get the hell out of here, and and um, like I won't I won't walk around there at night by myself filming, you know, because uh, it's very dangerous. But um, yeah, it's just. Uh, Going around with someone who's trusted and, and and kind of getting known in the in the community. There'd be plenty of times when I would go down and I wouldn't even shoot. I would just like, I'm just going to hang out, you know, um, uh, just put in the time of of having me be seen as as a familiar face. Well, that makes sense. Um, Olivia Hunter says, "Thank you so much for sharing, Joe. Your work is so inspiring, and I can tell the love and care you have for your subjects." I was wondering how you approach these difficult subjects from an emotional aspect, sort of in a way what a doctor might, what a doctor might remove himself emotionally while doing surgery, et cetera. Do you find yourself needing to disconnect? Does the camera help you? Um, I should disconnect more than, more than I do. It's not, I, I recognize that, uh, it's not healthy for me to get as vested in these stories as I, as I do. Um, I kind of feel like though that that's my, that's my secret sauce, you know, and, and that if I didn't get that emotionally connected, I would be afraid that I couldn't make the kind of photographs that I want to make. Um, that it, that they would feel distant. Um, uh, you know, the flip side of that is sometimes I feel like I'm walking around with like wearing a like a Velcro suit where everything that gets thrown at me sticks to me. You know, and and doesn't you know I'm just I've just never been the type of person that just kind of lets things roll off of me. Um, I don't have a lot. You know, just being straight up honest. I don't have a lot of great self-care practices and rituals and, and things probably stick around with me longer than are healthy. Um, you know, I don't, fortunately don't engage in any kind of destructive behavior around it, but I'm sure I'm not sometimes in such a picnic to be married to. Um, <laughs> but uh, I take breaks. You know, I, 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 when I, when I was coming back from a trip, I had been traveling a lot and I was really burnt out and I was really raw. And I just spent the day dealing with a, a very intense story, got to the airport, found out that my flight was delayed five hours and just collapsed on the floor of the airport. And just like, that was it. That was the, I just like, Next thing I know, like somebody's helping me up, you know, uh, I was like, okay, I need to take a break, <laughs> you know, and it shouldn't, it should never come to that. But the, the concern is that if I get detached, then I won't be able to do, to do what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, let's see. She adds, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Tom says, thank you, Joe, that was emotional and powerful. I really appreciate your motto that there is no substitute to just starting a project. Two questions. What was the organization you mentioned that support those getting out of homelessness? Uh, it's called ACE Programs for the Homeless and, they're, and they're, they're based in Long Island City. Oh, okay. They've been around forever. They started out as the Soho Partnership hundred years ago mm -hmm. uh, and they've and they've grown to this amazing organization okay um and in the gun violence project how are you recording the stories of your subjects what are the important parts that you want the viewers to understand um when you say how am i recording um i mean like literally how am i recording or I guess it's more what information are you oh, um, trying to get? And, and I guess maybe a little bit of the 
um, what you're actually, are you, when you're not, if you, of course, when you're filming, it's different, but yeah. are you recording the audio? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I'll have a little Zoom playing, you know, uh, just because I, I don't want to be sitting there taking notes, right. you know, while, 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 while someone's talking to me. Uh, I don't have a whole list of, well, you know, here are my 10 questions that, that, that I want to ask you. It's a conversation and, 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 and we see where it goes. Um, I don't really, I, I don't, I try not to, when I go to photograph someone, I know very little about their story. I, I don't read up on it. I don't Google them. I, I don't, I try, I try to know as little as I possibly can. So I come in completely open and, and un you know, um, completely unbiased based on anything that I might read, you know, I, I don't want to know anything, you know, um, I don't want to form any, any, any opinions. Um, so then it's just a conversation and I'm learning about them and, and I'm, so I don't have a particular thing that, that, that I want to say. I want to be a, this conduit to them getting their stories out into the world and whatever they want to talk about you know, is fine, you know? Um, I mean, yeah, I have some themes that, 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 that run through it. Um, you know, um, what's life like now versus what it was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? Um, you know, what do you think people don't understand? Like, you know, but mostly it's, um, I wanna know about the relationship that they had if they were a family member of a victim, I want to know about the relationship that they had with this person. I, if if they themselves were were shot, I, I, I whatever they want to tell me. Honestly, what, what, it's their story. It's not it's not about me. So whatever they want, whatever they want to tell me, and whatever they want the world to know, uh, that's what I'm there for. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Olivia asks another question. What draws you to different locations? For instance, how did you find the church in New Orleans? What brought you to DC? What draws you to a location? A story, you know, just like, like if, if um, meeting somebody, hearing, you know, talking to somebody online and they, and they say, oh, this, this is amazing. I really, I'd love you to be, to be a part of this project. Where are you? Tucson, okay, <laughs> let's go to Tucson, you know? And then when I'm going, um, I would then, um, add, you know, cause again, it's a, it's a tight knit community, the gun violence community. So I'd say, hey, do you know anybody else who might want to participate in this project? Or I put it out on, you know, usually that. And, and usually then they say, oh, well, as a matter of fact, talk to this person, talk to that person. And then I end, I'll end up meeting a bunch of people while, while I'm out there. But no, it's it's a it's a person. It's a it's a, and it's yeah, it's a person. But it's also again the idea of wanting to maintain diversity, you know, and, and not wanting it to be, you know, the 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 typical media narrative of Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, Oakland, Miami, mm -hmm. you know, Brownsville, whatever. Um, but to really say that it's that it's everywhere. You know, so if I feel like it's leaning, if, if months go by and I feel like, okay, I'm leaning way too heavy on, on big cities, I'll say, okay, I'm going to, I'll come back, you know, I, I'd love to speak with you down the road, but right now I'm going to Oklahoma, you know, uh, just to try to make sure that, that, that I'm telling a, a broad story. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten involved with legislation at all? I haven't really, because because again, I don't want to um, I don't want to come in with with an agenda, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I I've never gotten involved with any of the big gun violence prevention organizations, every time for gun safety or mom's demand action. Because when I show up in someone's living room, I just want to be a guy who's interested in their story. I don't want to be the every time photographer or the mom's demand photographer. I just want to be a guy who got on a plane, you know, um, and I, so I don't want to be saddled with 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 that baggage. I don't want to, uh, um, yeah. I, don't, I just try to keep politics out of it. You know, I, I have my own, as as you know, very passionate and strong feelings about this, but this is more about storytelling than advocacy. 
-hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I also mean just in terms of showing your work. Oh, in that um, way. I mean, I, I had a thing at, at City Hall, you know, to, to, to City Council, I had something at the um, Hartford State, you know, the Connecticut State Capitol, um, just so, you know, the eyeballs of elected officials could could get on it, but it wasn't like I'm making a presentation in support of such right. and such bill, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any more questions or comments? Well, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you for coming to the other lectures that we've had before, Joe. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate your agreeing to do this. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And thank you all tonight. Um, thanks, thanks for having me and, and, and for the questions. I appreciate it.